Hello, everybody. No, it's not Dr. Nick. Today we're going to continue our discussion on Class A amplifiers. So, we left off looking at the concept of an AC load line, the idea of clipping, compliance, and how this would lead into power calculations. How do we determine the maximum load power? So we're going to take a look at this example from the text, how to solve this. And we're going to add a couple of uh, new items. For example, what's the power dissipation in the transistor? Because one of the things we're going to have to do when we specify the transistor is determine, well, what's the maximum current rating for it, the maximum voltage rating for it, what's the power rating for it? And we would also like to figure out the efficiency. What percentage of power that is supplied to the circuit is actually turned into useful output power? So the first thing we have to do here in order to find our load line is to do a, a DC analysis. Oops. DC analysis is required because we need to find the Q point. Right, what is ICQ? What is uh, VCEQ? So I'm just going to arbitrarily draw a line here. We'll figure out where the Q point on, on this uh, line is and uh, where the endpoints are. So first, what we would do, come back here, um, if, if we use an approximation technique and we said that the base was roughly 0 volts DC, that would lead our emitter voltage to minus 0.7 and we'd have about 14.3 volts sitting across the biasing resistor of 120. Remember that the capacitors are opens for DC. So our emitter current, which is of course the same as our collector current, roughly speaking, is going to equal uh, that potential minus the 0.7. In other words, 14.3 um, volts sitting across the emitter resistor of 120 ohms. And that will get us 119 milliamps. Now the VCEQ value we can get by inspection. We do not have a collector resistor. The collector goes right up to the 5 volt power supply. So VC is 5 volts. VE we approximated as minus 0.7. So VCEQ would be the difference. 5 minus a minus 0.7 or 5.7 volts. The other thing we need to do is get the saturation current and the uh, cutoff voltage. So we developed some equations last time. We said that IC sat is equal to ICQ plus VCEQ divided by RC plus RE. Now in this circuit there is no collector resistor so we can just say alright that's zero. All right. This is just a follower. So we expect a gain of around one. We expect a decent input impedance and a very low output impedance. Non-inverting gain of roughly one. As a matter of fact, when it comes to the uh, uh, calculations for things like input impedance and voltage gain, the large signal case really doesn't change. In other words, we would go about this the same sort of way. The input impedance would basically be 330 in parallel with Z and base which is set primarily by beta times the RE value in here. The R prime E value again, uh, value again is uh, fluctuating quite a lot in a large signal case, so we just look at that as a sort of a um, distortion um, device, if you will. That's what creates some class A distortion. So, same kind of thing with the gain. We would just sort of assume that's a uh, non-inverting gain of 1. Continuing back here, our VCEQ, excuse me, our VCE cutoff, is going to equal VCEQ plus ICQ times RC plus RE. All right, so back here, the ICQ we know is 119. The VCEQ we know is 5.7. And then like I said, RC is zero. What is RE? This is the AC value of emitter resistance. So that's equal to 120 in parallel with 32 ohms. That's 25.3. Okay. 32 ohms, by the way, could be something like um, a small loudspeaker, might be 32 ohms. 8, 16 are more popular. 4 ohms, definitely very popular in car audio. 
but you sometimes see in, in small devices maybe a 32 ohm loudspeaker. Um, and this would be around the value you would get, maybe even a little on the low side for um, headphones. Right? So each ear cup might be somewhere in that range, 30, 40, 50, 60 ohms, something like that. Continuing back here, when we calculate through this whole thing, we get 344 milliamps for that. Back over here for the uh, cutoff voltage, VCEQ we know is 5.7. ICEQ, excuse me, ICQ is 119, and again, 0 plus 25.3. This piece will work out to approximately 3 volts. I'm going to hold on to that. So the whole thing works out to 8.7 volts. Now I can plot this. I know this point up here is 344 mils. I know this endpoint over here is 8.7. The Q point is 5.7 volts over, so it's down here somewhere. Okay. So that's 5.7 there. And then we got our 119 right back there. Now remember what we have to do. To find the compliance, we look for the smaller of the two pieces. Which is the smaller from saturation up to Q or cutoff to Q? Obviously, this is the smaller piece. So this was 5.7 volts. This piece was 3 volts, right? which is why I left it like this down here. So that 3 volts is the side that clips first. In other words, in this particular circuit, we get cutoff clipping before we get saturation clipping. If we thought of an input signal coming in here, this thing can swing up and down, up and down, basically 3 volts peak. So our compliance, we can say, is 3 volts peak. Or if you prefer, um, 6 volts peak to peak, right? the maximum peak to peak value. Now that I know that, we can go and find our maximum load power. Right, so this is going to give us, is an RMS value, um, just a little over 2 volts, about 2.11 around there. Meanwhile, P load max will be the uh, maximum load voltage, which I'll use the peak value here, 0.707, our RMS fudge factor times 3 volts peak. That'll give us the RMS value. Square that, divide by your load resistance. Now remember, we're not using the combo. We're not using the 25.3. We're going to use the 32 ohms because I want to find the power that literally goes into the load, not the combined power between the biasing resistor and the load. I just want to find the load power. So they're in the AC case, they're basically in parallel, so they have the same voltage. Right? That's why we wind up with this. So when we grind through this, we wind up with uh, 141 milliwatts. Not a lot of power, but actually, um, that's a sufficient amount of power for something like a pair of headphones. Okay, you know, it's not going to make your, uh, you know, your home stereo, your car stereo, very loud, but for headphones, that'll be plenty of power. Okay. Okay. Now, one of the things we mentioned about the Class A is it has relatively low efficiency. So we would like to find what the efficiency of this circuit is, and as I said at the outset, I'd also like to find out. Um, you know, what's the power dissipation requirement on here? Now, the, the maximum current rating could be if we overdrove the amplifier, if we really put a large signal in here and it went into clipping, it could be as high as 344 milliamps, right? So, uh, you know, a decent chunk of uh, an amp is the, the biggest possible current we'll get through there. Of course, the signal will be clipped. Half of it will be clipped if we ever get up to there. Um, the voltage, the maximum voltage swing on this, you know, we're looking at a peak to maximum peak to peak swing again with clipping of uh, just a little under nine volts. All right, but what about the power? Well, the power in this transistor, as it turns out, is equal to the quiescent power dissipation (PDQ) as long as we're not overdriving it. This will work out because if we look at the signals, this is what we're going to see. 
without any AC signal, we have some DC value of collector current. And then when I add an AC signal to it, it swings up and down like this. So the average value of this is whatever the DC value is. And I can do the same thing for the collector emitter voltage. You know, if I just re replace this over here with VCE, there is a certain VCE that we get. And then when we apply the signal, it swings up and down. So again, you know, the positive area and the negative area basically cancel out. So that's the average value. So PDQ is just ICQ times VCEQ. Okay? So I just plug these numbers in. ICQ is 119 milliamps and our VCEQ is 5.7 volts. We multiply those up and we get 678 milliwatts. Okay. Not a lot of power, but more than most small signal transistors uh, could dissipate. If you tried to build this circuit with something like, oh, maybe a 2N3904, very popular small signal transistor you might use in lab, um, it's not going to withstand this. Um, if you put a big signal in here, roughly 680 milliwatts is going to be beyond the capacity of that transistor. And um, as you start to run this thing, very quickly it's going to start smelling funny. And um, you know, that's not a good thing, right? Fire and electronics don't mix. Okay. Next thing, right? that's our um, power dissipation on the transistor. But that's only part of the total power that's being drawn from the, from the uh, power supplies. So what's PDC? All right. What is the DC power drawn from the supplies? Well, as I said back here, the average current that's being drawn is the quiescent current, ICQ. Again, this thing is going to swing up and down, and I'm assuming we're not going to horribly overdrive this thing. So we've got 119 milliamps for the ICQ. That's the average current. And then we just have to figure out, well, what's the total voltage? Okay, well, the total voltage here would be VCC minus the negative VEE. All right, that's what we're looking at. So we have 119 mils times uh, 5 volts minus the negative 15 volts, which gives us a total of 20 volts. All right. And our DC power winds up being a little over 2 watts, 2.38 watts. Okay, so that's what we're drawing from the, the wall, so to speak, or batteries, whatever we have. The efficiency of a system is always your useful output power versus what you put into it to get it. In our case, the useful output power is P load max. What we put in to get it was PDC. So we've got 141 milliwatts versus 2.38 watts. Expressing that as a percentage, it's only 5.9%. And as we see, this is not an efficient system, right? You get not even 6% of the input power turned into useful output power. So basically, 94%. Uh, 94 just burns up inside the various devices, you know, the 330, the 120, more so, um, the transistor itself, okay? Um, you know, out of this 2.38 watts, you know, there's a sizable chunk of it right there in the transistor. So, not too efficient, but, you know, if we're talking about small signal amplifiers, we're not talking about big powers, so the simplicity of the circuit um, works well. It's, it's uh, sort of balanced out. In other words, if this was part of a much larger system uh, that was delivering, you know, a few hundred watts to a loudspeaker, well, I'm not going to quibble about the fact that this input stage is a fairly, a fairly low in efficiency because we're only talking about a couple of watts anyway, right, out of a few hundred watts, so it's not a big deal. Um, but if this was a final output, yeah, there's probably um, other things that we could do that would improve the performance of this. First thing, of course, would be to say, hey, can I get this Q point maybe back here somewhere so I can get an even swing? By doing so, I'll get a bigger output voltage. In other words, I'll get a big, bigger compliance, meaning a bigger P load max, and hopefully we can get this efficiency up to a more reasonable value. Remember, the maximum theoretical efficiency is only 25%. 
So we're never going to get it up to, you know, 75% or something like that. But we can improve it. The other thing you could do would be to shrink the, the, uh, the far side of it. In other words, uh, you could actually reduce that power supply a little bit. And that would sort of bring the line over here. In other words, why swing down 5.7 if you can only swing up 3? Well, I'll just swing down 3. So if this was uh, you know, like a 2.5 volt power supply, we could still get the same result as far as the swing here. But the total voltage that we're applying, in other words, back here, would be reduced a little bit, and that would reduce the PDC, and reducing the PDC would increase our efficiency. Okay? So a lot of these things are tied together. Uh, but that would be a typical example of our Class A amplifier. There you go.